we're, we're continuing this, story, this series this summer. And, and interestingly enough, the way that this whole kind of series came together is that last fall, um, I, I, I kind of walked through and, and felt like, as we, as we discussed, as I discussed with the eldership, and that when I say last fall, I really mean like last fall, kind of moving up into Christmas. These are the things that I feel like our church needs to hear. We need to preach through some of these things this year. And we began to kind of order some things, and I gave them uh, several different um, options as far as things that I've been thinking about and why I feel like we need to have these conversations. And then as the, the year kind of got going here in 2018, we got to a point, and I remember taking a step back and thinking, okay, we need to put some things maybe on hold for just a little bit because one of the, the massive conversations that doesn't happen in church enough, it's not one that we really like to deal with because it's hard, is how we wrestle with fear, really wrestle with fear. And not just that, we pay lip service to the idea that our God wins over all of life, we pay lip service to the, the idea that God has given us this divine victory over everything, and yet I think for so many of us, we continue to walk through life. We continue to, to engage in our relationships. We continue to, to try to do work. We continue to wrestle with finances. We understand uh, health issues, and we look at all of it, and everything sometimes, at least, hits, it's going hit, to hit us at some point. We just feel overwhelmed with fear, with the what-ifs. Like, what do we do with this? And no matter how many times we sing songs or we hear sermons or we read scripture or we say our prayers and we ask God for strength, there are moments where the other voice, wherever the other voice is coming from, seems like the strongest, most real voice. The one that speaks to us and tells us, God really doesn't love you that much. He's not that good. The one that tells us, you're not good enough no matter what you do, is not good enough. The idea that, and this is where we're going to go today, is the fear of change. The idea that change isn't worth it. It's too hard. It's, it's too much. Some of you will remember this, uh, a few, uh, maybe a month or two ago, uh, our, my friend and, and our friend of this church, Nathan King, gets up and does his, uh, actually it was Easter, and Nate gets up and Nate begins to give his communion talk, and he talked to us about caterpillars and the metamorphosis and the movement and the transformation into being butterflies. And I remember as he started, I was like, Nate, I love you, but dude, where are you going with this? Like, it's Easter, and you've, you're, you've been talking about caterpillars for like three minutes here. And I kept thinking, I don't think Nate slept last night, because this may not. But as he kept going, if you will remember, some of us were here for this, he began talking about this chrysalis moment and all of the things that happen in the process of going from being a caterpillar to being a butterfly. And as the butterfly emerges, all of the wounds, all of the scars that had marked it as a caterpillar are gone. And when the butterfly comes out of the cocoon and begins to engage life again, that stuff is gone. All of what had marked it as broken, all of what had marked it as feeble, all of what had marked it as life is too hard for you has been changed, and it is gone, and those wounds and those scars have been transformed into something new. The crazy thing is, and I don't know how scientists come up with this, there are moments, I will just tell you when it comes to people who are scientists, I think they make things up and then tell us and because none of us are scientists, sometimes I'm, we just look at them and we're like, that is genius. That's crazy. But here's one of those moments. And I don't know if this is true or not, but scientists tell us this, that butterflies actually remember, they can remember life and how they got the scars and the wounds and the brokenness before going through the process of transformation and becoming a butterfly. Now, that could totally be a lie. And if it is, this is a terrible analogy, okay? But think about that for a moment. That they emerge transformed and new, and yet they can look back and go, I know what I used to be. I know what used to, br to break me down. I know what used to be something that held me captive. I remember the scary stuff that got me that wound or this wound, and yet now 
here is the transformed butterfly. And I think what is so crazy for so many of us, and I'll just start here, is I think the victory of Jesus has given us this transformational process, but I think for so many of us sitting in the room, we still can't see the butterfly in the mirror. All we see is the broken, wounded caterpillar. And here is the God proclaiming over and over and over, no, I've made you new. But we look in the mirror and we're like, it doesn't feel like it, God. It doesn't seem like it. I still feel just as messed up as I did before. And so what is this real victory of Jesus then? I want to talk through a few of the things that I think come with this. And I think our connotation of change, when we think about butterflies, that sounds amazing. And yet when we think about change as Christians, that connotation is not amazing. I mean... One of the things, and I'm, I've been, I, all I've ever done with my professional career is work in churches. When you use the word change in church, everyone loses their minds, it seems like. Unless it's your idea, and they're like, see how great this is? And then everybody else is like, it's not that great of an idea. Let's just keep everything the same. Because for some reason, our connotation of change is overwhelmed with fear, or we have gotten to a point where the comfort of what we're going through is like, I, I actually really like my comfort zone. I like this. It may not be ideal, but it's mine. And yet, I think there's this God who's stepping in and saying, I am trying to give you better. And to be honest with us, with you, I don't know that we always look at God and go, yes, I would like better. Because most of us understand change is hard. And being healthier and getting healthier is often extremely hard. I want to read for you a couple stories today. And, and, and the reason I bring these two stories to you is because of who these men have been for the church for 2,000 years and how we view them. Here is this moment where Jesus is kind of making his way towards the cross. And for the first time, he begins to tell his disciples, this is in, in Mark, he begins to tell his disciples, this is what it means for me to be the Christ. This is what it means for me to be the Messiah. This is what it means for me to bring and inaugurate God's kingdom into our world. Let me tell you what this means. And he begins doing all of these types of things. And everybody is looking around at this point and going, oh my goodness, this Jesus is amazing. Look at all of the things that he is doing. Look at what is coming. And because of worldviews, because of perceptions, because of what they interpreted from Scripture, there was this moment, and, and you see this from Peter in this text, he, they had figured out, they thought, this is who God is. This is Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 27. Jesus went out with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? That is the question of life, by the way. If you can't answer any other question in the rest of your life, the one question you should seek to answer over and over and over is, who is Jesus? Everything else will fall into place if we seek that, that question right there. They answered him, John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, one of the prophets. But you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter, asked, uh, Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he strictly warned them, this is Jesus, he strictly warned them to tell no one about him. Then he began to teach them that it was necessary for the Son of Man to suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, to be killed and, and rise after three days. He spoke openly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Please let that sit in, sink in for just a moment. Peter is rebuking God. I like Peter. I feel like I might connect with him sometimes, but this is not smart. Okay? He's rebuking God, okay? Excuse me. Then he began to teach them, because I want you to hear this. He openly spoke about this. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning around and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking about God's concerns, but human concerns. Calling the crowd along with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone wants to follow, me, follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me and the gospel will save it. For what does it benefit someone to gain the whole world and let lose his life? What can anyone give in exchange for his life? 
For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. And he said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God in its power. Peter, the most vocal and confident of all of the disciples, and sometimes I wonder why he was that, but for some reason he is, recognizes and speaks up and, and, and actually gives us the confession about who God is. He gets the confession right. His, his identity that he sees in Jesus, the identity of Christ, he gets that part right. You're the Christ. You're God's Messiah. You're the one who is to come. You're the one who's supposed to fix things. But Peter's issue, and you see this throughout all of his life, Peter's issue is that how Jesus becomes king, he doesn't get. He knows you're God's Christ, but how we get there, Peter doesn't understand. Peter believes that the way that you get the kingdom of God into its full power in our world is to dominate people. They were looking for a military leader, a king by their standards, somebody who would overthrow the government, somebody who would use domination to get their way. That's what Peter thought he was getting. And you can see this even later on because when Jesus is arrested after being betrayed by Judas, what does Peter do? He pulls his sword and swings it at one of the guys who's arresting Jesus. Peter struggles to figure out what does all of this mean. If Jesus is the Christ and God is fixing things, then what does that mean? And even later on, years, decades, literally decades after Jesus is raised from the grave, Peter doesn't, still is struggling to want to eat with the Gentiles. Because for Peter, he is a Jew and his nationality is all that matters to him. Israel's domination is all that matters. Keep that story in the back of your head. Because for Peter, safety and security, longevity and influence are accomplished through domination. They are not accomplished through sacrifice. They are not accomplished through servanthood. They are not accomplished through meekness and empathy. I want to read you another text from maybe the other greatest apostle that we know of. Paul is on the road to Damascus, and at this point, the apostle Paul is not even the apostle Paul. He's actually some Pharisee named Saul who is breathing murderous threats against the church, and he is imprisoning women, children, and men. He is murdering people, or at least standing off to the side and watching the murders take place. If you remember, when Stephen is stoned, one of the ones who is standing there with everybody else is Saul, a young Pharisee. And he goes on this journey because he is after Christians. He is after the church. And he goes on this journey, and as he's on this journey, many of you know this story, Jesus the Christ, not God, just so you know, in Acts, Luke tells us this. He wants us to know it is Jesus who comes to Paul and says, why are you persecuting me? In the way you treat these people, why are you persecuting me? And there's this moment of total confusion. You can see it because he's asking, he's like, who are you, Lord? He's blinded for three days. He spends time with a guy named Ananias. And here is this journey through brokenness and blindness for Paul. And he comes out on the other side. And as he comes out on the other side, here is what Acts chapter 9 tells us beginning in verse 20. Immediately he began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues to the Jews that he is the Son of God. All who heard him were astounded and said, Isn't this the man in Jerusalem who was causing havoc for those who called on his, this name and came here for the purpose of taking them as prisoners to the chief priests? But Saul grew stronger and kept confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Messiah or the Christ. After many days had passed, the Jews conspired to kill him, but Saul learned of their plot. So they were watching the gates day and night, intending to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and lowered him in a large basket through an opening in the wall. And when he arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. 
since they, not, since they did not believe he was a disciple. Barnabas, however, took him and brought him to the apostles and explained to them how Saul had seen the Lord on the road and that the Lord had talked to him and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. Saul was coming and going with them in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. The one thing that's interesting about Saul is that he believed that what he was doing was right. Saul was 100% in on what he was doing, believing that he was actually serving God and protecting the name of God, protecting the integrity of God's people as if God needs our protecting, by the way. He had become so convinced of his faith in his worldview that he was murdering and imprisoning God's people. And just to be honest... Everything about Saul, for the most part, had to change. So here's my question over the next couple of minutes and few minutes that we have left. Why do we fear change so much? I'm not looking for, like, general answers to this question, by the way. I I actually, most of the time, I I really want us to think communally, but this morning, I would really love for you just to think individually. Why do you, why do we fear change so much? What is it about change that brings out so much fear and anxiety in our lives? And I think for most of us, the biggest issue is we have, we've made an idol out of how we believe and what we see in the world today. That's become our idol. That's become our God. And I don't think we got there on purpose. One of the the books I've I've, I've really appreciated reading over the last few years is, is by a guy named Larry Osborne, and he writes a book called Accidental Pharisees. And the entirety of this book is this movement as he begins to kind of unfold for us and show us why it is so easy to buy into legalism. Because when we buy into legalism, when we buy into creating walls, we find comfort in those walls. And when somebody has to deconstruct part of our worldview, it is so nerve-wracking because now all of a sudden we begin to question, well, what else do I believe that's not right? And it feels like when you deconstruct one part of the faith, then all of the faith begins to fall apart. And the craziest thing about it is, is to some degree, I will tell you, you're right. But the fear comes from the fact that we have bought into the idea that our belief system, our worldview, our understanding, that has become our God. And if Jesus' goodness is our God, then he can transform and change whatever he wants, and it's all going to be all right. Change is interesting because it forces us to recognize our hu- it forces us to wrestle with humility. But it also forces us to wrestle with fallibility. That we just might be wrong. And I don't know how to say this. I feel like one of the things that church leadership should do is to critique culture sometimes. This is not judgment so much as it is like, let's bring into light some things that are just there so we can see them for what they really are. And we live in a culture where being right is all that matters. It is all that matters. We live in a culture where being right is the ultimate goal, and if we have to manufacture truths, if we have to spin things in a certain way to be right or to win, that's what matters. All that matters is winning and being right. And there's no space for being wrong. Another book, and I'll, I'll just show you. I have it up here. This, is, this, is, this, this book is, was very revolutionary to some degree for me, and that's probably because I'm not smart. But it's called Being Wrong Adventures in the Margin of Error. 
And this lady named Katherine Schultz writes it. And one of the things that she says is she states, a whole lot of us go through life assuming that we're basically right, basically all the time, about basically everything. About our political and intellectual convictions, our religious and moral beliefs, our assessment of other people, our memories, our grasp of facts. As absurd as it sounds, when we stop to think about it, our steady state seems to be one of unconsciously assuming that we are very close to omniscient. She goes on to say, We look into our own hearts and see objectivity. We look into our minds and only see rationality. We look into our beliefs, and it is reality. And when it comes to our major worldviews and beliefs and our convictions, it seems like only massive trauma to our egos will let us change or help us change. You saw the stories. Peter has to be challenged publicly by God as part of his journey. Saul has to meet the risen Jesus on the road, be blinded for three days, become totally helpless before he will take a step back and go, maybe, just maybe, I have not gotten this whole thing correct. Not just that, but what's interesting, if you can come back to that butterfly moment, is that Peter gets a new name. So does Saul. Because when God raises us up from the dead, he wants to give us, give us a completely new identity. That's the beauty of it. I try to be a student of our culture because, and I've told you all this before, people will ask us, and especially newer folks to Raintree will say, okay, Josh, like, like, where is Raintree headed? Like, who are you? What are we doing? All those types of things. And I'm like, well, I can tell you what we're doing. As far as where we're headed, I don't know. Like, I'm not the spirit. The only thing that matters and the only conversations that we have in our leadership is what is the next step in spiritual formation for you? Like, what do you need? How can we help you become more fully alive and more fully free for God? And what is the next step? And we do. We talk about you as individuals. And I think one of the things that the church needs to hear today I don't know if you got this, but this is what I got when I was a kid. I'm watching the time, just so everybody knows. I got time left. But one of the things that the church needs to recognize, and I think it will not just bring us freedom, but it will also bring us a greater witness to the world, is that rather than doubling down on our existing convictions and worldviews, we make space, real space for growth. Because in our culture, and I'm going to just critique our culture for a moment, even when we're wrong, people do not want to admit that, ever. We have to keep pounding our current views because the worst thing in the world in our current culture today is to be wrong. The worst thing isn't the hurt we inflict upon other people. The worst thing isn't the relationships that we may lose along the way. The worst thing isn't how pride becomes the overwhelming sensation for who we are. The worst thing is just being wrong. And the crazy thing that also begins to work against us in the midst of that, and some of, you will, some of you will understand this, when we start naming the things that we've gotten wrong, a lot of us get real defensive for many reasons, and one of those reasons is the fact that we, just, we, we were raised to see the world a certain way. And if we change and we call something wrong, then we feel like we're convicting our own heritage. And we say, well, I don't want to... I don't want to throw my parents under the bus, or I don't want to throw the church that raised me under the bus, and I don't want to do this, that, whatever else. Look, first of all, every one of us is messing up our children. Let's just say it, all right? 
And every one of you were raised by people who messed you up. Okay? And they were raised by people who messed you up, messed them up. Welcome to our world. And I've heard it said one time that kids spend all of their life wanting mom and dad to say they're sorry, and parents spend all of their life wanting their kids to say thank you. We live in a world, that, like this is it, but it's, what's so crazy, especially once we get into churches, is the minute we change theology a little bit, we have this, well, I wasn't raised to see the world this way. I'll tell you a quick story. I grew up Church of Christ. Very, very conservative Church of Christ. One of the things, and some of you are church, uh, former Church of Christ people, we're detoxing. Um, I should not have said that. <laughs> Let's just pray my parents don't watch this. But I grew up conservative Church of Christ, and if you know anything about the Churches of Christ, we don't use instruments. We did not use instruments. And we made that not just a salvation issue. We made it an issue where we would literally tell people, you are going to hell if you use them. If that sounds crazy to you, it's because it is. All right? Like, that's craziness. But that's what we told people. And I remember being 16 years old, sitting, on a, sitting in the back of a yellow bus on the way home from a basketball game, when one of my good friends, who just happened to be Baptist, said, you think we're going to hell, don't you? You know what I told him? Yep. And his response was, because we use a guitar, right? And I said, yeah. And he looked at me, and I promise you, and I'm telling you right now, at 16 years old, as a junior in high school, that was the end of our friendship. The end of our friendship. And the thing was, is I walked away thinking I was justified. Hey, if you don't want to hear the truth, then that's fine. That's, his, that's on him, that's not on me. And this is the way that our world works, and this is the way so much of our faith works, and this is the way because being right and winning the argument and somehow beating other people down or making them feel horrible or excluding them from some sort of grace and spirit-driven movement of God, somehow we find value in that. And we feel like we can overcome our own failures by making other people feel like a failure. Because Fear of change and transformation is, it's too much. And the question that I want to ask you today is that I don't, let me just make the statement first, then I'll ask the question. I don't think change is the biggest issue or concern in the room. I think the biggest concern in the room is this. What are we missing out on when we refuse change? That's the question, isn't it? What does the church miss out on? What does Paul miss out on if he refuses change? What does Peter, what does the church miss out on because they refused change? What does your marriage miss out on because you refuse change? Well, now it's real, isn't it? You know? What do your kids miss out on because we refuse change. Because the answer to the question, if you believe Jesus is who he says he is, is that you and I miss out on a fuller life. And we get existence under the power of fear rather than freedom through the grace of God. That's what we miss out on. We miss out on intimacy in our marriages. We miss out on our children understanding the humility of their parents. We miss out on real life. And God can't do great work in us because every time he just tries to pour out grace upon us in di discipling, we look at him and we say, no, I don't necessarily want that. Because we, one of the things we do know and have figured out is that we realize none of us really need just one change in our life. We need like 37. And it's like, 
well, if we start down this road, it's going to be a long road. Yep. Here's the thing. I was telling my brother-in-law and sister-in-law this last night. My personality is one where I am driven for affirmation. A lot of that has to do with my own brokenness. In fact, most of it has to do with my own brokenness. Most of it has to do with my fears that I am working through. I'm driven for affirmation. But God, in his infinite wisdom, I'm going to put that into quotation marks, gave me a son who was driven by affirmation. And I look at this child, and I'm like, you are killing me. What is wrong with you? And I look at this kid, and I think, dear God, do not allow me to become so prideful that I would refuse any change. His heart's too tender. Because I don't want to be the man that needs trauma to change. I want to be the guy that steps up and goes, God, you spoke. If you go back to Amanda's conversation last week with Abraham, you spoke to me and you said go, and I picked up and I went, expecting your faithfulness along the way. Because that's what he's promising. And the best thing for Christians today is you and I are literally living in the time when God's victory over fear is our foundational life. That is our reality. We may not get much else right about what our real reality is and how we perceive the world, but the real reality of, when, of, of the times in which you live is that fear has already died. He's just speaking to us, asking, will you recognize what I've done? That's good news. And yet the truth still remains, change is hard. Will we buy into the God who overcomes all of this and has overcome it? And he's just begging us, can I just give you my victory and you just take it? I want to invite the band to come back up. We're going to sing one final song. And I don't, I don't know where this goes for you. But I have learned one thing about life. You don't change on your own. That's just the way that it is. Because if you could change on your own, you already would have. You know? We get to where we are a lot of times because we're doing it on our own. And here comes the voice of God through others who can help us, even if all they say to us is, oh, I've been there. And now we have a partner for the journey going forward. That's supposed to be Christian living in community. Ask for help if you need it. I want to say a prayer, and then we'll have one last song. Father, we love you so much for who you are. And we praise you for the way in which you care for us. And I pray, I pray with all of my heart, God, that you would overwhelm us with your faithfulness today. That there is no hurt, there is no pain, there is no fear that you have not already overcome and that you are speaking this victory to us that we can go on this journey with you. And then we pray that you'd give us the courage to just say yes. Father, may your spirit speak to us in ways that only you can, and may you give us the humility and the hearts to receive you. And it's through Jesus that we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing.